Well, thank you, Mazdek. I'm really pleased to be here, and I've had a wonderful time so far today, and hopefully I can repay you a little bit by telling you something about the chemistry that we're doing in our lab. We're a surface chemistry laboratory. We work a lot on lipid membranes and interfaces and trying to understand the procedures that happen at them. I'll focus primarily in today's talk on the binding of transition metal ions, especially the first row transition metal ions, like from manganese all the way through to zinc. These ions had not been shown, actually. They're well known to bind to proteins to form what are called metalloproteins. They bind very tightly. But they had not been shown, actually, to interact with lipid membranes. The traditional model of a lipid membrane is that it's mostly a scaffold sitting there and that the proteins sit in it in the fluid mosaic model and that they're mostly passive participants. I think in the last decade or two, it's been shown very definitively that they can be active participants. And by adding data from transition metal ions and their interactions, I hope to show you that they can even be very important participants, especially, unfortunately, in some disease states. So we'll concentrate today on looking at basically copper, zinc, and a little bit of work from nickel. These ions here follow what are called the Irving Williams series. If I have the two plus form of everything from manganese all the way to zinc, these bind especially well to lone pairs on nitrogen, whereby the manganese binds most weakly and is over here on the left side of the series. It then actually reaches its tightest point here by nickel and copper. Nickel 2 plus, copper 2 plus will often bind very well to moieties like a free amine. And then, of course, zinc has a filled D shell and it binds more weakly again. So when we start thinking about these ions and their putative interactions with membranes, we should think about the most important lipids in chemistry and start out with things like phosphatidylcholine, which is usually considered almost the hydrogen atom of lipids. So here's PC. It's got a phosphate moiety as well as this quat nitrogen or choline. So it's switter ionic and we don't expect large interactions. But if we look at some of the other ones, they're actually charged. So unlike phosphatidylethanolamine and phosphatidylcholine, the three most commonly negatively charged lipids are phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylglycerol, and phosphatic acid, each bearing a charge of minus one. And all of these have phosphate. They're called the phospholipids. So they have phosphate as the negative charge. And of course, you can undergo ion pairing. So if I take something like magnesium ion or calcium ion, they bind rather weakly to phosphate. So an equilibrium dissociation constant might be on the order of a millimolar or so. In the case of the positive charges here, things like the free amines, well, they wouldn't necessarily be expected to interact with those so-called Hofmeister ions at all. On the other hand, the free amine on both the phosphatidylserine and on the phosphatidylethanolamine can now interact by donating its lone pair to the d orbitals of copper, to nickel especially. And those binding events can be far, far tighter than the binding events that you might expect through purely electrostatic effects through the binding of, let's say, magnesium ion to the phosphate moiety. So to actually test this proposition, we do a lot of microfluidic work in our laboratory. And so I guess to start the talk to show you some thermodynamic data, I'll start out by showing you how we actually measure thermodynamic data. So here's a microfluidic channel. This is polydimethylsiloxane on glass. So it's a very simple system with a long channel. The 
green part here is just the fact that we coat the inside of that channel with a lipid bilayer. So we take vesicles, we flow it through the system, and the inside gets coated with a membrane. So we're going to be looking especially down here on the planar glass support. So we're going to image from above. We'll dope in a little bit of Texas Red DHP. Maybe one lipid in a thousand has this chromophore on its head group, just so that we can visualize it. So we're going to hit this with green light. It'll fluoresce in the red, and we can just take a black and white image. So here's a black and white image. Zero PS means that we didn't put any of that phosphatidyl serine lipid. Just to remind you again, that's the one with that free amine on it. It's actually one of the more complex lipids in the sense that it's got a carboxylate moiety and a phosphate, so two negative charges, as well as the free amine moiety here. So I can either put in some of this that should bind to copper or just use all phosphatidylcholine where I shouldn't have a binding site. And I can do two more things. I can change the pH at which I run this experiment. So I can either run this experiment 3.6 or over here at 8. And I could start out by putting no copper, which is the case here, or I could add copper. And now when three things are present, and only when all three things are present, that is, you employ copper in the system, you run this at pHs that are more basic than about 5.5, and you have phosphatidyl serine in the membrane, what you see here, when all three are present here, is that it's dark. That darkness is because the copper has come down, bound to the surface, and those fluorophores have been quenched through a resonance energy transfer process. So instead of fluorescing out, so we've hit them with green light, and instead of emitting their light, they've been quenched by the copper. That's just a DD transition in the copper state. So now they're dark. These are line profiles below. And you can clearly see that there's a tremendous drop in fluorescence. This blue case here represents the line profile across the last one. So we've lost something like a factor of five, six, seven in terms of fluorescence intensity when the copper is bound. And notice we've cho chosen to put in 800 picomolar. So this is clearly not an electrostatic interaction. Again, those would happen at something like a million-fold higher concentrations of divalent ions. Magnesium, calcium would bind about a millimolar to those phosphate or carboxylate moieties instead. Well, since we found this new interaction, this interaction between phosphatidylserine lipids and copper ions, we wanted to characterize the stoichiometry of this complex. So what we do to do this in this case is to make a simple plot of fluorescence, F0, that we start with and divide by the change of fluorescence. As I just showed you a moment ago, it goes down by something like a factor of six or seven once I add sufficient amounts of copper. So that will make this y-axis rise here if I divide the new fluorescence by the initial one by a factor of six or seven or so once it's completely fluoresced. And in this particular case, what you can see is about 17 micromolar. We went up and this leveled off. Well, this was very interesting because what we had done was we had put exactly 34 micromolar of PS lipid into this system. So we needed exactly half that much to reach the maximum quenching, which is consistent with about a two to one binding complex. That two to one binding complex happens in the following way. We're making a square planar coordination compound. Phosphatidylserine, if you cut off right here at this free methylene unit, what I have is an amine and a carboxylate left. That is connected by just a methylene group and just looks like glycine, if you just think about the end of that PS lipid. Well, glycine is known to form a two glycine, one copper sandwich. That has been known actually since the 1960s and 70s. There are some references. It's a square planar complex. And so indeed, that sort of idea of a coordination complex from glycine carries right over into phospholipid membranes. And we should get this two to one dimerized complex 
to be able to form. An interesting question arises if that's really the case is, well, does this complex actually occur in this cis form where these amines are on the same side, or does it form in this trans form where the two amines are actually on the opposite side of the complex. Now, if I take lysine, there's actually a little bit of free energy difference. The trans state is actually just a few kcals per mole lower in energy than the cis state. Surprisingly, when we went through and tried to understand how this system was working, we turned to our friend Laura Gagliardi at the University of Minnesota who does density functional theory. And when she did a DFT calculation on how this ion binds, you can see from the color coding here, these two nitrogens are blue and they're actually on the exact same side, telling us and in agreement with some EPR measurements that we also made that the complex is really all this. And it's interesting. Not only do we get a pure square planar complex, the opposite complex would be almost impossible to form. And this has to do with the geometry of a bilayer. One lipid would actually have to come out of the membrane and almost try to bind itself on top of the other to get the trans complex. So this is the first identification of a coordination compound that's been formed in a lipid bilayer and it's almost completely pure in its formation. And as I've already shown you, this will bind at picomolar levels. We wanted to understand this particular interaction in more detail. When we turn to infrared visible some frequency generation in order to do it. And we were really quite shocked at the result that we got out of this. What we were trying to see is does the interfacial water structure change substantially if I'd add copper ion and let it bind in the square planar complex as opposed to letting calcium ion or one of the more standard Hofmeister ions come down and bind? So what we have here is a subphase. We have a lipid monolayer sitting here at the air-water interface and we let infrared and visible light come in and produce light at the sum of these two frequencies. This technique is surface specific. And the reason it's surface specific has to do with the quantum mechanical selection rules. In the case of SFG, I'm taking an infrared process and multiplying it by a Raman process. And to actually get infrared and Raman transition simultaneously, I have to break inversion symmetry, and that will happen at interfaces, but not in bulk aqueous solutions. So the really cool thing about this nonlinear optical technique, or what the physicists call three-wave mixing, is it allows me to get a vibrational spectrum just to the water molecules that are aligned here at the interface. And presumably, when copper or other ions come and bind, they'll actually change the interface quite substantially. And so we looked at the CH and OH stretch portions of our vibrational spectrum to see what was going on. This is the CH portion. Those are from those alkyl chains. They're sticking up in that monolayer at the air-water interface. And this broad peak here from about 3,000 all the way past 3,600, these are from OH stretches. And for those of you who looked at vibrational spectrum before, you know that the vibrational spectrum water is unique. This is, comes from basically a quasi-continuum of different heterogeneities of these OH stretches. At an interface, you see evidence for two clear peaks, one about 3,200 and another one at about 3,400. The 3,200 peak is really more tetrahedrally coordinated water. So if I shined an infrared beam through an ice cube, I'd get a peak at about 3,200 wave numbers. If I shine an infrared beam through a glass of water, on the other hand though, I get a peak up here past 3,400 wave numbers. So more ordered water, less ordered water. And at the interface, I expect the less ordered water to be the water that's right next to the lipid monolayer. Why? Well, 
I can break coordination. I actually go from solid ice, which has four hydrogen bonds to two or three when I go from solid ice to liquid water. But when water molecules need to hydrate phospholipids, the distance between phospholipid molecules is about seven angstroms or so. And so it's impossible to keep registry. So if I have hydrogen bonds trying to stick up into the lipid molecule, I won't be able to hydrogen bond each one of them. And so this last water here, the peak at 3400, is telling me what's coming right to the interface. So the first case I show you here is TRIS. This is just a buffer solution no divalent metal ions in it, and so I get these two nice peaks. When I add either copper chloride or calcium chloride, those peaks are both gone. So that tells me that that last water layer, whether it be from calcium binding, presumably to the phosphate or the carboxylate on phosphatidylserine lipids, or copper, which forms this coordination complex that involves the amines and the carboxylates in a very different way, that that water has to be displaced in both cases. But there's a tremendous difference here, and there's a reason for that. That difference down at the 3200 region comes from water that's not at that last layer, but from the electric field. So PS is negatively charged, a phosphate, a carboxylate, two negative charges, and that amine has a positive charge. Well, that aligns water beyond the first layer. Interestingly, though, something very funny happens when you think about this reaction that we're talking about, phosphatidylserine plus copper forming this coordination complex. What we have is we're releasing two protons. This amine, which normally has a pKa of something like 9.5, actually can get shifted by something like four pH units, very low. So what you have is metal ion assisted deprotonation. So that copper can come in, forms a coordination complex and can displace the proton in the process, but it binds bivalently, right? It binds to two lipids. So we release two, two protons, bind one copper two plus, and what we're doing is not changing the interfacial charge at all. That's remarkable. I've done surface science for a long, long time. And when you take salt and you put it up against a negatively charged layer, let's say I have a fatty acid monolayer, and I allow magnesium or calcium ion to bind, I start out with a layer that's heavily negatively charged, and you put salt in the bulk solution, the metal ions come and bind, and they quench the charge at the interface. So I start out with something that's highly negatively charged, and I end up with something that's not. In this case, this is an unquenchable surface charge. Every time one of these copper ions comes and binds, I add two plus from the copper ion in this coordination complex, and I've released two hydrogens in the process. So as a consequence of this, the negative charge at this interface remains unchanged. And that's what's actually showing up in this water layer here. So if we look at the 3200 peak, this peak, especially if you look here on the red side of this peak, looks hardly attenuated. Nonlinear optical spectra are actually different than linear optical spectra in that there's a convolution between all these peaks. That's how what's called the chi-2 term actually mixes various contributions or resonances. But if we fit the oscillator strength of this red peak, and compare it to the black one above, it's about 95% of the strength of the original one versus this one here from the calcium is down by a factor of about two or three. But I've actually run this experiment where calcium is far below 100 micromolar, is not enough to saturate the binding site, yet I've killed a lot of the charge at the surface. So I've gone from a negatively charged surface couldn't have possibly used up all the sites because the equilibrium dissociation constant is in the millimolar, but I've already started, oh boy. <laughs> this is a very aggressive operating system. So, sorry about that. So, what we have 
is a situation where calcium, despite the fact that I put it in in trace concentrations, is able to very rapidly attenuate the surface charge. Why? Because it's only binding to the carboxylates and the phosphates. And so their charge is changing a lot. This copper here, this is way above the equilibrium dissociation constant that had already bound tightly in the picomolar and nanomolar range. And I'll show you some of the specific values. And yet, despite the fact that we're well above KD, we've hardly changed that water. So this is a situation where the actual charge at the interface does not change despite specific metal ion binding. And this will have consequences as a function of PS concentration in the membrane. So in this particular experiment, I'm actually now showing you what happens is I go from 20 mole percent in this microfluidic channel of that phosphatyl serine down to none. So in this particular case, that's on a complete phosphatyl choline membrane. So if we take a line profile across here, this is no added copper, so zero nanomolar copper. And I'm showing you now on the right-hand side about what I was showing you before. So about one, one or so or a little more than one nanomolar. And so in the 20 mole percent channel, as before, we're getting a huge quenching. Again, factors of five, six, seven. But as I'm moving over to the right here, by this one mole percent case, we're hardly seeing any quenching at all. And you could say, well, you have less PS in the membrane. And that actually does make a difference. It'll make the maximum amount of quenching that I can get a bit lower because the average distance between a fluorophore and that divalently bound complex is now a little larger. But it's actually not accounting for the tremendous difference that you actually see. One of the advantages to using microfluidics is that it's a high throughput, low volume, sample volume system where we can rapidly actually explore a variety of conditions. And so here's a tremendous amount of data between one and seven and a half mole percent of PS lipid in these membranes. And I'd never seen on lipid bilayer surfaces anything like this before. If we start down here at one mole percent, so here's the binding curve, comes up, levels off. Notice the fraction quenched is, of course, smaller than for these higher concentrations of PS, again, because that average distance between the fluorophores and the binding complex is further apart. But if you look here, the equilibrium dissociation constant, where we bound about half the sites, is maybe on the order of 100 nanomolar, 100 and 50 nanomolar copper ion. But as I go to 357, we march across, so we're down in the picomolar range as we continue to add copper. Now, we've looked at bivalent binding before when you can bind once, twice, or even multivalent binding. And usually, these binding events only change the equilibrium dissociation constants by maybe an order of magnitude. And clearly here you're seeing that we can march left by many, many orders of magnitude in this particular case. Moreover, I can't actually in a straightforward way get beyond seven and a half mole percent. Why? Because if I go to more than seven and a half mole percent, the binding continues to tighten up and I have free copper in the background of my solution. Even if I have 18 mega ohm water, I always have in the picomolar range at least some amount. So we're going to match the 7.5 mole percent condition here, this black curve. And we're going to repeat the data. But this time, we're going to do it with a competitor in solution. I'm going to use NTA, which has a free amine on this nitrogen. And it has a known binding constant to copper. And so if we use this at about 10 micromolar NTA, we can actually force the binding curves to the PS to now be well behaved in a micromolar range. And so here's the 7.5 mole percent curve I showed you before, but we can easily now go up to 20 mole percent and we can get the new data. The way you actually do the comparison is that you have KD competitive now. That's what we're measuring. Those are these binding curves. 
and we know the concentration of NTA, we know its binding constant, so we can get this competitive number that is the competition between this amine and the PS, and from that we can pull out this KD apparent, that's the binding constant that we were getting before. That's the apparent binding constant of copper to the PS in the case where there was no NTA in solution. So it's easy to pull back out. So I have these numbers now from one mole percent all the way up to 20 mole percent. And these numbers, when we actually pull out these measurements, go from about 150 nanomolar in the case of 20 mole percent PS all the way down to a few picomolar when I have 20 mole percent PS. So if I have 20 times as much PS in the membrane, I've tightened the binding constant by more than 10 to the 4, somewhere between 10 to the 4 and 10 to the 5. That's an enormous tightening event and one that would not be explained by this model. So this model is simple copper you think would come down, displace one proton here, then it could move laterally across the membrane, which is a two-dimensional fluid, and I could bind twice in order to make that complex. The mathematics for doing this mechanism are well understood. They obey this equation that I'm showing you right here. KD apparent has to do with the intrinsic binding constant KD1 times KD2, that's the second binding constant, divided by KD2 plus two times the concentration of PS in that membrane. KD1 is just this first binding event. Copper comes down and binds, this, that's this first step. KD2 is this rearrangement at the surface. So this complex comes over, finds another lipid, and binds again. So here to here, that's KD1. Here to here, that's KD2. And if you think about it for a second, they don't even have the same units. Copper, when it comes down out of the bulk, binds to the surface. If we're talking about equilibrium dissociation constant, that will be in units of molarity, right? I have some number of moles of copper per liter of solvent or water. Here, if I'm moving around on the surface, this is a number density. So instead of moles per liter, which is moles per decimeter cubed, we should really be talking about this in moles per decimeter squared, a number density. So KD1 and KD2 are not directly comparable quantities. Nevertheless, when they're put in the form of this equation, the KD apparent that you would get out of both of them does have units of moles per liter, and the equation fits to this dashed red line here. What it basically says is that the best I could ever hope to do if I were to add 20 times more ligands in the membrane, you can make KD1 and KD2 anything you like. If we just increase this number by a factor of 20, the best you could do is that, that this KD2 value should, uh, sorry, this KD apparent value should fall by a factor of 20. But you can clearly see there's an enormous difference here. We're not falling by a factor of 20. We're falling by a factor of something like 17,000. So we're getting a huge change. So what's this enormous change due to? So I can't fit to this hyperbolic line shape because of valency. So again, I turn to this issue that when copper comes and binds, displaces a proton here, frees that proton to form this coordination complex, the interfacial charge doesn't change. It remains the same. That's interesting. You usually quench that interfacial charge, which relieves the bulk solution, or the near surface bulk, of a huge ion concentration. Not in this case. The surface starts out negatively charged. You bind some copper ion, and it stays negatively charged. So what we have is a layer that's right above the surface that's actually heavily enriched in ions because this complex with two lipids and one metal remains negatively charged. 
And so what we have is some ions in the bulk and they're being attracted down to the surface. And you can use something called gooey chapman theory to decide, well, what fraction of copper will be in the double layer? What's the concentration of copper in that near surface bulk region compared to the real bulk? So within the first nanometer compared to, let's say, oh, 100 nanometers or a micron above the surface. And well, we know how much PS we put in the membrane. This is the surface potential, sorry, this is the surface charge density in coulombs per meter squared. To con calculate that surface potential, we use gooey chapman theory, and this is the Gram equation from there. Sigma is that surface charge density. We have some mole fraction of PS that's negatively charged. I have to be careful. TR means Texas red. That dye that we put in is also negatively charged. Many of these membrane dyes used in biophysical chemistry bear a negative charge. So I have to be careful to use that. But once I do, well, I know what my surface charge density was. And therefore, I can back calculate what this interfacial potential was. Once I know that interfacial potential from this Gram equation, then we can actually calculate not the apparent binding constant, but what's called the intrinsic binding constant. In other words, we're just measuring KD apparent. So that's that binding curve that I would otherwise get when I make the measurement. But if there is a thousand times more ions in the near surface bulk region, so if I put in, let's say, oh, a picomolar of copper, and there's a thousand times more ions because there's such a heavy negative charge at the surface, then within the first nanometer, there might be more like a nanomolar of ions. And this last equation here will allow you to correct your apparent dissociation constant depending upon the interfacial potential times the charge at the membrane divided by KT from that exponential, tell you what your intrinsic binding constant really was. And in this case, Gee, our intrinsic binding constant didn't change that much. In fact, if we take this data, the intrinsic binding constant, after peeling away the part that's from the interfacial potential, what you can show is that it now actually fits this equation for bivalent binding absolutely beautifully, right? If we go up by a factor of 20, we get about a factor of 17 change, and that's due to bivalent binding. The other factor of 1,000 is from having an unquenchable surface potential. So I've now shown you PS lipids. That's one kind of lipid that's actually present in this membrane. Another lipid is this phosphatyl ethanolamine. This also contains a free amine. The difference is that it doesn't contain this extra carboxylate moiety. And without that carboxylate moiety, you make a large difference. This is now not 20 mole percent, but 70 mole percent of this PE lipid. And so we've run an experiment here without and with PE in the membrane. And now it only makes a small difference in terms of the binding. It turns out without that carboxylate, you can't actually undergo metal ion assisted deprotonation nearly as easily. Having that negative charge there from the carboxylate help the copper outcompete the proton for the surface. So instead, we don't do very much quenching, and you don't change the binding constant. Why? Because we're not deprotonating. You have to deprotonate to keep that unquenchable surface charge. So we can go from zero up to 70 mole percent PE, and this binding constant all stays here in this low micromolar range, really doesn't change very much. So it's a remarkable difference between whether you have that carboxylate or not. Either way, copper is a very dangerous ion. Along with iron, it's the two most common ions used in catalysis and enzyme catalysis because they're redox active ions. Iron cycles between two, two plus and three plus, copper between one plus and two plus oxidation state. In fact, because of this, there's inorganic Fenton chemistry. If I take an oxidant in the presence of a copper catalyst, 
can actually form hydroxide radical. And this can go one way. This will actually reduce copper 2 plus to 1 plus. And with another equivalent, I can actually go the other way. You can go back and cycle this back and forth using cycles of Haber, Weiss, and Fenton chemistry. The question is, does this happen up here in the bulk versus does it happen down on the surface? And the answer is, gee, if I have PE or PS in the membrane, I expect to localize copper to the surface, and I expect this Fenton chemistry, therefore, to occur at the surface. So if I'm creating free radicals near the surface, I should know it, because what they will do is they will easily oxidize double bonds. So we can run an experiment to see if it's true. So we take this Bodipi dye. It's got this conjugated series. If I were to break this here, I can actually shift this fluorescence. So I can, if I have this in a bound state, in the presence of some sort of an oxidizer, I could turn this dye molecule off. And indeed you do. So if we run this experiment with no PE in the membrane, so no binding sites, no getter on the surface for copper, you only have a modest amount of oxidation. And that's because this Fenton chemistry mostly occurs up in the bulk. And yes, some of it will oxidize that dye molecule. Its intensity will go down to some extent. But if we switch over from no PE to 70 mole percent PE, what you see here is a huge change in the fluorescence. And that enormous change in the fluorescence can be monitored as a function of different conditions in the membrane. If you just have PE, if you just have copper, these changes with time are very, very small. But if you put in hydrogen peroxide and copper, you don't put in PE, this will give you Fenton chemistry in the bulk. That's this black curve. You do see a modest amount of surface oxidation, but as we go up in PE concentration, now we start to see by 70 mole percent a really significant amount. And this is important because now with having PS presented or PE presented at the membrane surface, we can show that you do a tremendous amount of oxidative damage. When cells undergo apoptosis, they actually flip PS lipids from the inner leaflet to the outer leaflet of a phospholipid membrane where they're actually exposed to copper 2 plus. Copper is heavily regulated inside cells. There's less than one free copper per cell, according to Tom O'Halloran. I guess he had a paper about 20 years ago in science where they actually tried to look at that. That better be the case, because otherwise what we've shown here is there are plenty of sites for binding PS and PE. They'd be on the inner leaflet of a plasma membrane. But when you undergo apoptosis, you flip it out. And then it can be exposed to the, the extracellular milieu, which will often have 100 nanomolar or a micromolar of free copper 2 plus running around. That can start getting oxidized and actually poking holes in the membrane, arresting apoptosis and making it necrotic. So it may be important in several neurodegenerative diseases, things like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's, exactly because if you have a reason to have metal ion homeostasis out of balance, you have dyshomeostasis, then you have this chance of undergoing tremendous oxidation chemistry if you're able to do this at the interface. So I think I'll finish up this talk by telling you about one last topic. I focused mostly on the copper ion here, but I'd like to tell you a little bit about zinc because it's a little different than the rest of what are called the transition metal ions. This is certainly in the same D block, but it's full. When it interacts with surfaces, it can still bind to a free amine in ways that calcium and magnesium won't. Calcium and magnesium, those orbitals shrink to a great extent once you actually remove the S electrons. Zinc has that filled D block. And that filled D block works in such a way that it actually shields or moves the energy of the S and P orbitals around, such that you can still bind and still do a little bit of charge transfer 
from free amines into zinc in ways that you can't do with calcium and magnesium. Well, even though it still binds, it's a challenge to look at from an analytical chemistry point of view because it won't quench dye molecules. This heavy metal quenching requires the fact that you can do some D to D transition. That's what I was showing you with copper with that resonance energy transfer. Now you can't. So what I'm going to do is set up a new assay and that new assay, I'm going to put nickel down on the surface. I'll put it down at 50 micromolar. It should bind, quench dyes. And if I take zinc, which is shown here in gray, it actually displaces the nickel. Well, that actually won't do a resonance energy transfer. And these dyes that were turned off should turn back on again. So we went to check to make sure that that would, in fact, be the case. So here's a one-channel assay. We add a little bit of EDTA above the surface here because we're going to actually be adding 20 mole percent PS into this membrane. And so if there's any free copper running around, it will actually do some quenching. So I want to make sure there are no metal ions. And then if I add some nickel, I, of course, quench this channel. So I go from this black case here to this red one. So no surprise, nickel like copper does the quenching. We can actually measure the binding constant. And now we add in a hundredfold higher zinc concentration and sure enough, it shifts right back. So we get that fluorescence intensity back. Well, we can do this not just with 50 micromolar nickel, as I've shown here, but do it with 200 micromolar nickel. No surprise, we actually are going to shift the apparent binding curve out as a function of zinc concentration now, right? More nickel in the system more nickel that actually needs to be competed against. So we're going to get different values. So if we plot KD apparent here versus the amount of nickel we put in, extrapolate this back to zero, should get from that the apparent binding constant for zinc back out of the system, and we do, 140 micromolar. So that binds much more weakly than copper does. Remember, that was down in the picomolar for its apparent binding constant. We're going to use another technique here that is, again, turned back to that infrared visible sum frequency generation. That, where it wasn't showing quenching of interfacial water structure before here in this 3200 region, now with zinc, we get a tremendous quenching, right, of PS. So that's negatively charged. That leads to ordering of waters at the surface. And if zinc can come down and cancel the charge at the interface, then that amount of water that's ordered should come way down. And it does here. We can fit the oscillator strength from underneath those curves. If we do that, we get a nice binding constant out of this. Where we show that the KD apparent now from this ordering of water by some frequency generation matches nicely to the data that we got by fluorescence. So we have a pretty confident idea we know what that equilibrium dissociation constant is with zinc. But just in looking at this assay, just performing this assay, what we saw is that this channel over here on the left does not look exactly like this channel over here on the right. What you see here is a bunch of evidence for these little white spots that start showing up when we add zinc but only when we add zinc to this system. And if I actually show you a movie of what happens, so now there's no nickel or no anything else. Here's fluorescence. This is a fluorescence response from a lipid bilayer. Put a scratch mark here. So you just take a pair of tweezers and you scratch across the sample. That just makes some contrast. Otherwise, it would all look bright. And what we're going to do is we're going to add zinc or zinc chloride in. And you see that the membrane gets dark and these little bright spots start to show up everywhere on the sample. This happens with no other metal ion. You can put in magnesium, you can put in calcium, you can put in copper, you can put in nickel. Only with zinc does this incredible change, this phenomenon of these little bright dots start to occur. If we focus in on one of these little bright dots, it's amazing. 
These little wiggles down here, this is the difference between background. You see these dark regions and these light regions. Initially, the whole membrane surface was uniformly bright. It's like there's patches of missing lipids. And in fact, if we do protein assays, we can see that molecules of lipids have actually been pulled off from the surface. This is the height of what the bilayer was before. And you can see this peak is up by something like a hundred fold from that. This is much brighter than a lipid bilayer was initially on the surface, as if I had the brightness of 50 or 100 bilayers as I go across this little spot here. That's this line profile, I guess, across here is what's being reproduced in that image. We can do fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching at that spot. That would be here versus the background membrane. It's actually recovering. The two-dimensional fluidity of the membrane is much, much slower. And of course, I can do underwater tapping mode AFM. So I take an AFM tip, come across the surface, and here's the height in nanometers. I go across one of these spots. It's actually hundreds of nanometers high. This three-dimensional structure is showing up in the case of zinc and only in the case of zinc. And it's causing these tremendous structural formers to start to occur in the membrane. What's happening here is that zinc is able to start gluing bilayers together. And when you add it to the surface, it's actually forming these bleb-like structures that are coming off the surface as evidenced by that atomic force microscopy experiment. And if we started looking at the number density of these blebs as a function of zinc concentration, so with 20 mole percent PS in the membrane, you see the number of blebs comes up and levels out. You'd expect that because you have only so many of these PS lipids that you've added in. If we do this by holding the zinc concentration constant and changing the PS concentration, so without any PS in the membrane, you don't have any of those blebs, and boom, it starts to come up as I add PS. So it's a phenomenon that's specific to having both PS and zinc in the membrane. So you might ask why. Why is it that zinc is doing this, causing these three-dimensional structures to form at this interface? Zinc's interesting. It will bind to phosphate and carboxylate, as I've said, more tightly than calcium or magnesium will because of a little bit of charge transfer. It can also bind to this free amine. It will only do so if that molecule is deprotonated. Zinc on its own will not deprotonate or not shift that pKa very much. But if we're working at something like pH 7.4 and the pKa of this is about 9.5, maybe 1% of those will be deprotonated at any given time. So zinc can bind here, here, and here. Copper will only bind in the square planar complex. Calcium will only bind either to this phosphate here or to this carboxylate. When I bind to copper, it's interesting. It actually pushes two lipids apart, right, to form that square planar complex. So if I make what's called a surface pressure area diagram, that's plotting the interfacial pressure versus the area of the molecule, what you see for just pure PS lipid is this black curve right here goes up. If I add zinc, what I get here is that I actually have tightened up this membrane. I've actually shifted this curve to the left. That's because these zincs, because they're binding to the phosphate, binding to the carboxylate, they're pinching the lipids together. If I compare it to something like calcium, calcium will actually do that too, but not nearly as well. It shows a plateau way up here. Even copper will show a plateau. That's here in blue, but that's much, much higher. At the critical concentration, which is about 30 millinewtons per meter here, that's the internal pressure of a bilayer. So if I have a lipid monolayer, I can push on it on a Langmuir trough. I can make that surface pressure what I want. You can actually measure what the equivalent pressure is of a bilayer. So you can't actually control that number, but you can see what it is by simply looking at something like the number of gauche defects in a membrane 
in a lipid bilayer compared to the number of gauche defects you have in a monolayer. And the monolayer equivalent is about 30 millinewtons per meter. At that pressure, what you see is zinc is heavily pinched in. Copper actually expands the membrane at that pressure just a little bit, of course, because I have to form the square planar complex. Calcium would do the same thing, but it's not accessible until higher concentrations. So this change occurs later, and the amount of pinching that you get from calcium is much, much smaller. So if you actually look at membranes, and we sit there at 28 millinewtons per meter, you actually get this beautiful phase transition data where you see this uniform phase actually becomes a two-phase system from the zinc actually condensing the lipids a little bit. If I do this with calcium or magnesium, well, above their binding constants, they look pretty uniform on the surface by comparison. So zinc can cause blebbing, cause curvature of the membrane because of the unique way that it actually binds with membranes. So I think I'll end here, and let me thank you so much for your attention. Let me thank the Office of Naval Research, the National Science Foundation, the students in my lab, especially Matthew Poynton, who started out much of this work and is now a postdoc at Johns Hopkins, as well as Chris Munson, who is now a faculty member at Southern Utah. And those two were assisted later by Simu Sun, Saranya Pulinchari, and Alexis Baxter, who've done this work. And thank you so much for your attention. difference in the complex formation you would expect because one is chelating ligand and another one is more dense. Can you repeat the question a little louder? Sorry, I had a hard time hearing. Uh, so you do have the membrane with carboxylic acid and without. Yes. And the one which is carboxylic acid, it can just chelate. That's uh, right. So and, and basically chelate effect can change dramatically complex formation constant by several orders. And that's what we're exactly seeing in the case of PE versus PS. So phosphatidyl ethanolamine that just has the free amine, you can't deprotonate. But that deprotonation event is very special because if I'm sitting at fixed pH, then basically if I'm sitting around physiological pH, the presence of that carboxylate basically allows the copper to come and bind tightly enough. This chelation effect is an electrostatic effect in the case of carboxylate to copper, but then a little bit of electron transfer, right, from the lone pair on the nitrogen into the copper. That gives me a deprotonation and keeps the surface charge unchanged, right? I release two protons. So this difference leads to the case where in one case, I don't have to actually deprotonate the surface first. I don't have to go up in pH, but in PE I would, so I suddenly don't bind very tightly, and I don't bind very many PEs, right, because I don't have this metal ion-assisted deprotonation. So this assisted binding, this assisted chelation effect is actually worth quite a lot in terms of its membrane biophysics. Yeah. <clears throat> I was wondering if this blending effect had been uh, documented in certain medical conditions or did it, uh, you know, did it relate to some uh, biological... So Tom O'Halloran has shown very nicely in oocytes, in egg cells, that um, you actually can induce curvature. This is all in cellular environments, not in model systems. You pack high concentrations of zinc inside cells and you lead to fusion with the sperm cell where you can cause curvature in the presence of zinc but not in its absence. As far as I know, this is the first instance where we've actually shown that zinc is what actually induces curvature on membrane and causes the blebbing process in a chemical system. What about throwing in a bunch of zinc in a cell culture, for example? 
Right. Outside of cells. Now, of course, it's more complex because I've got lots of different lipids, lots of cholesterol, and other things, so I have a less controlled system. But that's what I'm suggesting. At least in the case of oocytes, there is some evidence that this is of physiological relevance. It's a nature chemistry paper from O'Halloran, I think about two, three years ago. Any other questions? Well, I'll ask my question then. So uh, a lot of people who do Alzheimer research, and, they, you know, and, and there's a lot of perhaps sense and nonsense spoken about uh, you know, whether uh, heavy metal ions have an effect on deteriorating membranes or others. I assume that based on your work, you believe that all of those, in, you know, if those things were not done in the presence of membranes, then perhaps they're rather irrelevant. So, especially when we're talking about copper and zinc. Each one of these diseases is different because they each have a different protein that's been mutated to cause them. But the end effect of all of them is, is if you get out of metal ion homeostasis, then you have the problem that you have excess metal ions running around in the bulk solution, you undergo apoptosis, you start to bind, and as long as you also have an oxidant around, and you almost always do, hydrogen peroxide is just one common one that I've used, but there are others. You start oxidizing membranes, you can poke holes in them. When you arrest an apoptotic process, it becomes necrotic. We're working with some cell biologists right now. We're doing simple experiments in HeLa cells. You know, so what happens if you take a cell, you induce apoptosis, and you add copper, and you add hydrogen peroxide. Can you actually arrest the apoptotic process, force it to go necrotic? And you can. But this is very much correlated now, or it seems to be correlated with this idea of disease in the sense that when you look at victims of Alzheimer's disease, and you do an autopsy on a patient, and you look at the senile plaques that are ever present in the brain, what you will see is that these senile plaques are correlated right above portions of necrotic cells, because that's in fact what you have. The, you have cells that simply have not actually been removed at that point. And everywhere where you have one of these plaques, which is chuck full of transition metal ions, it sits right on the membrane surface, and the membrane is oxidized right below it. And so we believe that that probably arrests the apoptotic process because you can just simply start rushing ions in and you, you break the equilibrium that's been maintained. Apoptos apoptosis has to take place over a period of time, and this will simply arrest the process, turn it off in an instant. Any other questions? Mario? You talked about the square plane assist coordination on copper, and you also commented on the organization of the order slash disorder of water right underneath the copper layer. So I'm wondering, is it actually even possible um, to have actually an octahedral coordination with two more water molecules around the copper, and that this may have a directing effect? Of course it does. So what what's your so of course, so what you're going to have in addition to this square planar complex, right, you get a Jan Teller distortion. So these other two waters are going to be further apart. But of course they're there. They're just, right. Okay. All right. And, and will they have a directing effect? So sure, they should be part of this water layer that I'm showing you here. So when we show the spectra of the SFG of that near surface layer, you expect that the water molecules that are bound to the copper are well aligned. So sure, they should be contributing to that signal. Absolutely. Anything else? Any other questions for our speaker? Well, if there are no more questions, join me in thanking him and you can talk to him.